Hello everyone and welcome to your place for all things paranormal, supernatural, metaphysical, and conspiratorial. Today we're going to be talking about Woodrow Derenberger, the sewing machine salesman with friends in high places, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) With friends in high places. Yeah. That's that's a good one. (laughs) I'm Tanya. (laughs) And I'm Chris. Welcome to... The Triangulum. <laughs> welcome, everybody. <laughs> yes, welcome. <laughs> well, I don't know how else to explain it. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you. Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so here we are. Yeah. Episode 14. Episode 14. Yes. And I, I just <laughs> I want to actually point out something a little bit interesting. So we're at episode 14. Episode 13, if you're unaware of it, was uh, about energy healing. Yeah. And wow, some people <laughs> really? don't uh, don't like people talking about that. No, no, mm-hmm. they don't. No. No, I don't know why. I really don't. Me either. You know, it's pretty interesting just to, to see. We got a lot of angry emojis. Yeah. You know, how the physical and spiritual bodies kind of work together. Mm-hmm. And how they, you know, they're connected to yeah. the energy. And it was weird energy. too, because it was like the first few days that it was out there, a lot of a lot of angry peeps, yeah, and some some churchers trying to give us the word, yeah. And then uh, after that, it was like there was like a weird shift, yeah, a weird energetic shift. It Imagine was, that. yeah. And then the downloads started like coming in, started coming in, yeah. So I was, at first I was like, "Are you serious? Are you serious? People don't <laughs> want to talk about energy healing." Yeah, it's a huge component uh, component of uh, metaphysical stuff. Huge. Well, sure. Anyway. Brings the power back to you. Yeah. At first I was like, I was a little disheartened. I was like, oh no. Yeah, I was, well, I was surprised and I wasn't that surprised. People well, aren't yeah, that I interested, guess. you know, even though it's important, but they're not that interested. Yeah, I get it. It's it not as be, exciting as... It had to be talked about though. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So I'm thankful that it turned around because I, yeah. wor- I was worried for everybody. I was worried for... Yeah, it's a good show, man. All y'all. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good show. But good it finally show. it finally came around, so we're good now. We're good. Yeah, yeah. Episode fourteen. Episode fourteen. So this story is going to be about. I love this story. Woodrow Derenberger. Yeah. And his buddy. Yeah. Which most of you might be more familiar with this name than you are with Woodrow's name. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Indrid Cold. Indrid Cold. Yeah. Yeah. Now. We're going to tell you, we're going to focus mainly on Darren Berger's first uh, interview Mm -hmm. after his encounter, which was remarkably the very next day. Yeah. um, Live on the news. On the news. Yeah. Yeah. Weird, eh? How times have changed. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let's get into it, right? Okay. Date, November 2nd. 1966. Right. At around 7.25 at night. Right. Woodrow's driving home. Mm-hmm. He's driving home on Route... No, Interstate 77, sorry. Right. Just before he gets to the interchange of Route 47. So he's driving south. Okay. From Marietta, Ohio, to his home in Mineral Wells, right. West Virginia. He kind of... I guess he's in the Parkersburg area or something like that. Mm-hmm. So driving along, everything's all good, except there's a car that comes up behind him on the highway and wants to pass. It blinks its lights to pass. You know how people do that. Like just to forewarn you to let you know that they're going to go by you. So this car goes by, but as the car goes by, Woodrow thinks it's being followed by another car. Yeah. And it wasn't until he kind of out of the corner of his eye realized it wasn't another car and he looked over at it that he realized it was a ship. Yeah. And it was a ship following very closely behind this car. Like he estimates, I think, 50 feet. Yeah, I thought, yeah. 30 to 50 feet. 30 to 50 feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he notices that it's not a car. He looks over at it. And then this ship passes him, swerves in front of him. And it's kind of long. It's longer than it is wide. Yes. It swerves in front of him. And then it kind of rotates. So now it's lengthwise, like widthwise, sorry, right. across the lanes of the highway. As it rotates, it's slowing down, which is forcing Woodrow 
to slow down. Mm-hmm. Not abruptly. No. And he says that in his interview. Yeah. It wasn't abruptly. Slowly. Forces him to slow down and come to a complete stop. Yeah. On the side of the road. Exactly. Yeah. So that's when all of the encounter stuff happens. Yes. That ship forces him to stop. He actually tried to go around it mm-hmm. and he wasn't able to do so. No. He got kind of two wheels on the berm on the side of the road and two wheels on the road. And he was going to go around it, but there just wasn't space for him to go around. Yeah. Here's a little bit of backstory on Woodrow. Woodrow, he lives in Mineral Wells. He's lived there pretty much his whole life. He's a traveling salesman, sells sewing machines. Yeah. He's about 50 years old, I believe, at the time of this incident. He's a normal, nice guy. Mm Mm-hmm. So he has this experience, and he's pretty freaked out about it. Yeah. He has a a complete, full-on interaction with a being from this ship. Yeah. The very next day... Because actually he got home, he told his wife told about his it. his wife about it. She suggested they call the authorities. Yeah. And then you'll realize why they call the authorities after. I'll explain that after. Mm-hmm. But um, they they called, they called the police. The police ended up calling them back, asked if he needed a doctor. <laughs> he yeah. said he was okay. <laughs> and then they talked to him. So one of the people who talked to him over the phone that night was uh, a gentleman from TV station. Yes. And then I guess it was arranged the next day for him to come down and tell his story. Yeah, I have an interview. So we're going to give you a recount basically from his interview, which was televised live yeah. on November 3rd at around 4, I think, or something like that. Mm-hmm. For about a half hour, he answered questions and yeah. told him what happened. And yeah. he was interviewed by two two guys there. He was interviewed by Glenn Wilson, who I guess was a reporter at the time right. at uh, WTAP. Yeah. And Ronald Maines. And Ronald Maines was the general manager of WTAP at the time. Right. So you can find this inter- this interview online. You yeah. can hear it yourself. The you audio, yeah. thankfully, was saved. Yeah. Because Glenn was going to toss it out. Yeah. He was retired and he was going to get rid of it. He had the old reel-to-reel tapes and he was going to pitch it because yeah. they recorded the interview. Thank God he kept it, man. Well, it wasn't him who kept it. It was another woman who kind of saved them. I think her name oh, is Susan right. Shepard. Yeah. She, she got a hold of them and she <clears> was like... Excuse me. She, she kept them. She kept them, And then yeah. she had them transferred to, like, different forms of audio yeah, as time CD has progressed. and whatever else, yeah. Yeah. So in his interview, this is how it goes. He explains where he was traveling, and he explains how a car passed him, and that he, he explains that there was a ship following behind that. Right. He says that the object was about 30 to 35 feet long and about 9 feet high, mm-hmm. and it overtook his car pretty easily, actually. Mm-hmm. And then that's when it swerved in front of him and forced him to stop as right. it came to a stop. Right. When he came to a stop, a door opened on the side of the object. So that would be the side that's facing him. Right. Right. And a man stepped out and the man walked directly over to Woodrow's truck, but on the passenger side. Right. As the man approached Woodrow's truck, he told basically Woodrow telepathically or asked him if he could roll down the passenger side window. Mm-hmm. So Woodrow leaned across the truck and rolled down the window. The man approached the window, smiling the whole time, like very kind of just being nice, I guess. Yeah. Or, you know, not being frightening. I, well, it is frightening, but not being like, yeah. Yeah. you know, sinister in any way. Not like the drawings <clears throat> that we're seeing of... No. Those drawings no. are just ridiculous. <laughs> My God. All those pictures that you see drawn of online Indra Cold, of Indra just Cold are like bullshit. way off base. Yeah. Just, because nowhere in Woodrow's um, interview does he suggest that he looked like that at no. all. He said that he looked like a very normal average guy. Just and we'll get to that description yeah. after. But he definitely didn't have that creepy ass Joker smile that Joker, he's depicted he's with in most psychotic. of the pictures you see online. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the man said to Woodrow that he would like to talk to him. And Woodrow says in his interview that he was scared and couldn't speak. And the man told him not to be frightened. Mm-hmm. And then he asked, like, why are you why are you afraid of us? And Woodrow couldn't speak. Couldn't speak, yeah. Yeah, he was too he was too freaked out. Rightly so. Yeah. It's 1966. He's probably never seen anything like that in his life. Yeah. And he stopped in the middle of an interstate, which when I looked at the map, there wouldn't have been much around there at that no, time anyway. No, I doubt it. Yeah, so yeah. by himself out there, yeah. unless there's cars passing, which he did say he in did his interview, say there some was cars, cars were passing, yeah. and, and this man would look at them occasionally, Yeah, but not anything serious. Yeah. So the man asks Woodrow what he's called, 
And Woodrow understood that to mean that he was asking him what his name was. Right. So Woodrow told him what his name was. And the man again asked him, why are you frightened? Yeah. The man said to him, don't be frightened. We wish you no harm. We mean you no harm. We wish you only happiness. And that's when he told Woodrow that he was called Cold. Mm -hmm. And that's the only name he gave him at that time. At that time, It wasn't until later that he gave him his first name. First name, yeah. So Cold asked Woodrow about the lights in the distance. He didn't point at them. He just kind of stood at the side of the truck and... It wasn't until later that Woodrow realized that Cold never moved his mouth yeah. when he was talking to him. That's what freaked him out, too. Yeah, he was frightened by that because he was yeah. getting all of... The, he was talking to this being. Yeah. Like, he was speaking English outright. Yeah. But Cold was speaking to him without saying any words. Yeah. So he was freaked out by the telepathy of the whole thing. He also told him that if, if you... I can speak out. Yeah, he's... Or, no, he told, he told Woodrow. Cold told Woodrow... You can speak out loud or you can think your thoughts. Thoughts and... Whatever is easier for you. Yeah. To with, communicate with me. Yeah. So I guess at that, t- at that time, Woodrow was just speaking outright because I guess he wasn't really familiar with the whole telepathy thing. He becomes yeah. more familiar with it later. As time goes on, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, Cold asks about the light in, lights in the distance and Woodrow understands that he's talking about this city, right? Right, right. And he tells him that it's uh, it's called Parkersburg. Mm-hmm. And then Cold asked if all the people live there. And Woodrow explained that it was a city and it was, you know, a place of businesses and trade and right. that people do live there and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And Cold said that where he's from, a place like that is called a gathering. Right. So where he's from, cities are called gatherings. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Woodrow's still scared. He's freaked out because yeah. the whole telepathy thing is tripping him mm-hmm. right yeah and he said they spoke for about 10 minutes mm-hmm. and then cold told him we will see you again and he left for his ship during that time let's go back and look at some of the details here okay he stepped off the ship right, right to come towards woodrow's truck yeah when he stepped off the ship to come towards woodrow's truck the door was closed mm-hmm. and the ship went straight up into the air about 75, 75 feet, feet yeah. and then stayed up there. Yeah. So it didn't block the road. No. It was only on the road for a few seconds while he got, well, cold got out and then it went up in the air and it waited there Yeah, for while, him. while cold was talking to Woodrow. Yeah. A lot of people talk about the way that cold was standing. Yeah. A lot of people bring up the fact that he was standing with his hands kind of like his arms folded across his body and his hands kind of stuck in his armpits. So a lot of people talk about this being indicative of hiding something. Excuse me. Right? Yeah. But perhaps the simplest explanation is best. Maybe his fucking fingers were just it's cold. It's just cold. Maybe, who knows, maybe his name wasn't even cold. Yeah, he was like, I'm I, cold. I don't think it was cold. I think his name was Indrid. And <laughs> he's just, it's cold. You know, and he put his hands under his... Under his yeah. arms. I know lots of people speculated <clears throat> about it being sinister in some way. The way he's standing is somehow sinister. But if your hands are cold and maybe you don't have warm enough pockets to put them in, yeah. I guess, you would put them in your armpits. <laughs> I've done it. I have. Yeah. It's warm in there. Exactly. I don't think there's anything sinister <laughs> about the guy keeping his hands I, in his armpits. I don't armpits. think so either. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's November, right? Yeah. It's West Virginia. Yeah. He was probably cold. It's cold. Yeah. So, get that out of the way. Number two, all those damn pictures you see online of him. (laughs) The Joker? Yeah, grinning maniacally, right? Like he's some sort of creepy, evil entity is not true. The other thing, too, is in his interview, Woodrow did not say anything about this guy wearing a tie because you'll see pictures of him with a tie like he's in a suit. Yeah. He never said anything about that. He said that he was wearing like a... Kind of an outfit that had kind of a metallic-y kind of vibe to it. Yeah, shine to it. Yeah, a fabric. He said there was a top coat over that. Right. That was uh, zippered. Yeah. He said that his shirt was open at the top. And the there button. was buttons. Yeah, there was buttons. The button was undone because he said he looked at the buttons. He said the outfit was kind of a bluish color. The top yeah. coat was like a navy blue color. Yeah. And that cold himself was about six feet tall. Yeah. Maybe about 35 to 40 years old. Mm -hmm. He had dark brown hair, combed straight back. Well tanned. And yeah, he had skin tone that looked like he was well tanned. Yeah. Not like 
over over oh, tanned, not over but he's been but definitely in the sun. spent some yeah. time in the sun. Yeah, I think that was it for the most part. It's just that he was a very courteous, he just, yeah, he was you know nice, nice guy, neat, courteous, yeah, friendly, smiled the whole time. Yeah. Yes, smiled the whole time, smiled, but wasn't like creepy, not like grinning like he's going to cut you up and throw you in the freezer, <laughs> you know, as everybody depicts him, <laughs> right? Yeah, nothing like that. So, like I said, they spoke for about ten minutes. Cold said, you know. Okay, Mr. Derenberger, we'll be talking to you again or we'll yeah, be seeing we'll, you we'll again. We'll meet again. And he stepped away from the truck. And when he stepped away from the truck, the ship came back down. Back down, yeah. It came back down. It didn't land. It stayed about 8 to 10 inches off the road. Hmm. So it had no landing gear. At least Woodrow said it didn't actually touch the ground. It no, hovered. It had hovered, yeah. And while it was hovering, it made this kind of like a, a low fluttering sound that he said was similar to like... Helicopter, helicopter blades, blades, but not as loud. Yeah. And there was no difference in the sound of it or loudness of it while it was idling and when it like lifted off. Lifted off. Like yeah. it didn't get louder no. or anything like that. So the ship came down actually next to Woodrow's truck. Yeah. Woodrow said that the, the ship came down and it was now facing lengthwise in the same direction as he was traveling. Right. And the door opened. Cold walked around the front of his vehicle mm-hmm. through his headlights and then got into the ship. And mm-hmm. he said that he could see another figure another in there. Another figure in there. And he saw the arm and the hand of that figure, I guess, helping Cold into the ship. Maybe and who pulled, knows? Pulled the door down. Well, he said that. But later on, when you read in his book, when he was inside the ship and he realized how the door opened right. and closed because it opened to the side, right? right? That there was no way he could have seen somebody close the door because he had pushed the button that closes the door. So he was right. like, he he said, I think I was mistaken with that. Okay. So anyway, Colt gets into his ship. Yep. And he leaves. Leaves. Mm-hmm. And then Woodrow makes a very quick drive home. Yeah. yeah. Freaking out the freaking whole time. Out. Yeah. Yeah. And he uh, he tells his wife about it. That's when they call Peeps, and that's when the whole you know <laughs> set up the interview. <laughs> For uh, the news is is done. Yeah. Right? So the guys who do the interview have a lot of questions. They ask what Cold looked like. They asked about telepathic uh, communication. It was a good interview, actually. Mm -hmm. I liked it. It was just very well well done. They asked about the ship, what it looked like. And he said it kind of had like the shape of like a kerosene, old kerosene lamp. It was kind of tapered on the ends and more roundish in the the middle. In the center. He said it was a dark charcoal color. Shiny. Cold had asked uh, Woodrow if he worked for a living during their conversation. Yeah, yeah. And if he had to work for a living. Yeah. Which is an interesting question. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, it's one thing to work <laughs> for a living, but do you have to work for a living? Yeah. Uh, Woodrow explained to him that he was a salesman, and Cold told Woodrow that he was a searcher. A searcher. But it was never explored more, because Woodrow was too scared to ask any questions. Yeah. He just kind of stood there, or not stood there, but sat there behind his steering wheel just... It sounded like he regretted. In the interview, he said that at the end that he was questions. so frightened that he didn't think to ask any other questions. Yeah, yeah. Because he it's was, he was no, freaking no out. No doubt. Yeah, but that no makes doubt. sense. Yeah, of course it does. That makes sense. I'm not whipping out my list of questions to ask people. <laughs> you know what I mean? When I'm stopped in the dark on a highway by a, a, ship? a ship. Yeah. yeah. That's not the thing I'm thinking about. I would like to think I would. Yeah. But you don't know until you're no, in that situation. Exactly. Exactly. Right? There was a couple of times Woodrow stated in his interview, there was a couple of times that Cold had to ask him to keep looking at him. Yeah. 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 Like, just, just just to keep keep eye contact. Yeah. Mr. Derenberger, look at me. Look at me. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I guess maybe he felt like Woodrow was avoiding it. Yeah. Or wasn't he looking around to and looking out the window? He did. And, he, and he leaned forward and, and was looking, looking out through his ship. windshield and, at the ship yeah. hovering above. And yeah. yeah. And he had, he also says in his interview that he had good light to see this he guy. He did, yeah. Because he walked in front of his vehicle through the headlights yeah. and his interior cab light was on. And as they were talking, there was vehicles passing on the highway yeah. and as the yeah. vehicles came up from behind, they shone good light on him. So he had, he was very... He could be seen. Mm-hmm, he was very competent in his description of yeah. what cold, Mr. Cold looked like. Absolutely he was, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, he was pretty upset after the encounter and he did, like I said, he stated in his interview that he wished he had asked more questions because he felt like Mr. Cold would have, he would have answered. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Yeah. The interviewers asked him if he believed in flying saucers 
and he said he didn't believe in flying saucers and that he had read about them in like the paper and yeah, stuff, but yeah. he, he never in believed passing. in them. Yeah, he yeah. never believed in them. And then actually Wilson, Glenn Wilson asked him, do you believe in them now? And he stated that he believed in what he saw last night. He didn't believe it was a saucer, but it was definitely some sort of alien aircraft, aircraft or space, yeah. spacecraft. spacecraft. He also said that if he had heard this story the day before from somebody else, he would have thought that that person was a nut. Was a nut. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's such an honest interview when I heard it. I, I was just like, listen to this guy. Mm-hmm. He's just telling the truth. And interestingly, the interviewers asked him, do you drink? Do you drink? Yeah. And he, he said he doesn't drink. He, doesn't, he actually said, I don't believe I in don't drinking. I don't believe in drinking, yeah. Yeah, which would lead me to think that he's probably a little bit religious. At that time. Yeah, yeah. At that time. So they talked about the sounds that it made. They talked about whether his headlights stayed on the whole time. They had all these like weird little questions and stuff. They talked about the way that cold was standing, the whole armpit thing. His weight. Yeah. 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 Again, did he have a tie? They brought in a few times, you know. Yeah, he described how he was dressed and he didn't say anything about a tie. Yeah, there's no tie. Woodrow did say that he believed other people should have seen this. Yeah. Should have seen the ship. And he believed that there was another car traveling in the opposite direction to him that would have seen the ship, but... They'll never know that for sure because he was saying no. he was blocking the road. Yeah. Right? The Wilson guy verified, well, not verified, but corroborated that Woodrow was, you know, freaking out that night because he spoke to him over the phone that yeah, night. Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah. And he, he said he knew, he knew that Woodrow was scared yeah. and nervous and it took some time to like calm him down. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So when they were finishing up their conversation, Woodrow right. and Cold, right. Cold had actually told Woodrow to tell local officials, tell tell whoever, yeah, about what has happened here. Yeah, he did, and that cold would confirm the story later. Mm-hmm. So it's actually good that they called the police, and now you see why this guy did an interview. Yeah, he was told get everyone to know. Yeah, right now, as far as cold saying to him, Mister Derenberger, we we will be seeing you. <laughs> we'll be seeing you again. Truthfully. <clears throat> Mr. Derenberger was not a fan of that, <laughs> and he says it in the interview. So Maines, the general manager of the television station, asks him, do you believe yeah. that he will see you again? And Woodrow responded that, I did believe it, but now I don't know how to answer that honestly because I'm afraid he will, and I don't want him to. Yeah. But I have a feeling he will. He will. That's his actual line. I love the way he said it too. Well. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm afraid he will and I don't want him yeah, to, but I have a, a feeling totally, he will. Totally honest cool answer. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> like how much more real is that? No. That's it. That's it exactly. I heard it I was just like smiling cuz this is just telling the truth, man. Yeah. At least that's how it seems. Yeah. No. Like when you hear him talking, he sounds... He's like a nice guy, man, yeah. that you'd want as your neighbor, you know? Yeah. He seems like a, a really normal, yeah. easygoing, yeah. honest, nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if he made it up, he's got some imagination. I doubt but it. But I don't think so. I don't think so either. So that interview lasted about 30 minutes. Yeah. And there was some talk about two other guys, two truckers who had had an experience with a ship also on the road mm-hmm. that had stopped them. Yeah. Although they refused to give their names. Yeah. They didn't want to tell anybody who they were. And it was, I think, that night or the night before, something like that. Yeah. It was very close to the same date. There was a few people who said that they had sightings. Yeah. Yeah. But nobody could confirm that it was the same. Same thing. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. And then some of the sightings, when you read about them, you realize that they're describing different different things different people yeah it's it's not i mean if this guy is that average you know what i mean the things that these people are describing which are not average at all yeah it's not the same it's a pretty important case because you can see how things just spill out of control oh it got way out of control even over years like it just Mm -hmm. the people what they're saying and then you actually hear him speaking Mm -hmm. it's not even the same story no no, not at all. Like, I don't know how you get it that way. Like, he's telling you that read or listen to what he's saying. I'll tell you that. how it got that way. Because at the same time, in late, I think, 1966, right. around the same time, in West Virginia, into 1967, they were having all of those Mothman sightings. Right. And people have combined the two. Yeah. 
but they're not related. They're not. Other than place and time. Yeah. They're not related. Yeah. Indrid Kuld and the it's, Mothman. It's not the Mothman. Are not the same thing. Yeah. They're not tied together in any way. They have nothing to do with each other. I don't know why it always... Uh, uh, well, yeah, because anyway. I guess it's way more creepy if... Yeah, again, Hollywood, Hollywood, here we go. Let's make the As story usual. something that it isn't because that's the only thing. It's just like we were talking about the Travis Walton case. Mm-hmm. He, and he said, I regret that that's Yeah, because the they did they, that movie, Fire in the Sky, yeah. which was supposed to be about his experience. And they it really nothing like it. jacked it up to make yeah. it seem sinister and yeah. scary. Scary. Everything's fear. Horrific. Yeah. And that wasn't what it was at all. Because yeah. if you see him in his later interviews, he says, I wish I hadn't. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't done that. I regret that. Because it's completely misleading. Yeah, it it's was. not what happened. Yeah. And I think in a certain way, that's what people do with this. They're like, oh, we got this guy who's a weird entity, and we have this Mothman thing here, and they were around at the same time, so they must be the same thing. Yeah. How is that the case? I don't even know how they come to get the two together. You could be walking through the woods, and a deer walks through the woods. That doesn't mean you and the deer are the same thing. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's just bullshit you know uh, that's why more and more I, as time goes on even now, and now media i just don't believe anything they say well it's hard yeah uh, it's hard to believe anything they say and people you have to be more discerning say. jesus you have to verify things for yourself because so many people are just totally just bullshitting yeah absolutely absolutely you know, to get their little bit of fame like it's just bullshit well that's what people say about woodrow they're saying yeah. that he's bullshitting to get his fame he wasn't getting any fame. He didn't get any fame. He was to ruined his life. He lost his income. Yeah. His sales obviously went in the crapper because he was saying uh, that he would get calls for um, sales and he'd drive out there and realize they just wanted to talk to him about UFOs. Yeah. They didn't want to buy anything. Yeah. Then they started digging into their savings because he wasn't making any money. Money, yeah. And then uh, they had to move. Yeah, move. Mm-hmm. The they divorce. Moved f- they moved a few times. Yeah. 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 And there was like hundreds of people that would show up at his house yeah. to sit in his backyard and stuff and wait to see if they see UFOs. Just getting calls, mm-hmm. threats, crank calls. Yeah. Friends of his. So what did he gain? Family. Yeah. He exactly. Gained nothing. What did he gain? Now people will say, well, he wrote a book about it. Sure. He wrote a book about it in 1971. Yeah. A little, let's take a look here. A little 108, 109 page book. Which is a great book. Yeah, it's like about it's, his encounters. Yeah, and his I, I love that book. I read it. I just had a smile on my face. Mm-hmm. Just, just, a, just an honest, just an honest report mm-hmm. of, of his someone experience. who had an experience. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. just, it's just an awesome, awesome book. Mm-hmm. This poor guy, you know. But he didn't become rich and famous from it. this. Yeah, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. So one of the things I wondered when I was listening to his interview is that he was talking about this ship following another vehicle. Yeah. It was already tailing another vehicle, and then it stopped him Mm -hmm. after he looked at it. And I was kind of wondering if maybe they noted that he looked at it. Maybe other people don't see it. Yeah. Or other people don't register it. And him looking at the ship, they were like, Oh, he can see us. He can see us. It's like a vibratory thing. Yeah, he can see us. Let's stop and talk to him. Yeah. Because he actually looked at us. Yeah. Because, like, wouldn't some... Or noticed. Wouldn't the car that it was following... Like, wouldn't they at least say, hey, man, that thing was following me too? Yeah. Or did they not even notice it? Yeah. I just thought it was another car. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm wondering. Uh, or a truck or whatever. Yeah. His interview was November 3rd. November 4th, he had his second contact. Yeah. They were with, pretty close, like, quick, eh? Yeah, with cold. Yeah. And it was all through telepathy. He was um, driving in his vehicle. He had another person with him, actually, another passenger. They were driving, and he started feeling this tingling in his forehead. Mm-hmm. And then he, he knew that it was cold attempting to talk to him. And the tingling persisted until Woodrow finally answered him. Right. So I guess it's kind of like a ringing telephone. Well, t- telepathy, they say, is the universal language. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right? Mm-hmm. Thought transference. Yeah. Yeah. So cold told him, keep driving. I'm in the ship. We're above you. We're following you. Yeah. They had a conversation while he was driving and Cold talked to him and told him at this point what his first name was, Mm -hmm. that it was Indrid. Indrid, yeah. And that, you know, they talked about family stuff. They talked about all kinds of stuff while he was driving. Yeah. While he's got a guy in the vehicle next to him. 
Yeah. But they all, like Woodrow talked back to him telepathically. Telepathically. Because now he understands, for whatever reason, in like two days, he gets it. He understands how it works. Yeah. And he's able to think his thoughts and Indrid's able to pick them up. He tells him that he's married. His wife's name is Kimmy. He has two sons and a daughter. And a daughter. Yeah. He's from a planet called Lanolos mm -hmm. in the, I think he called it the Ganymede. Galaxy. Or... Yeah. I know that we have a Ganymede in our solar system. It's actually a moon. It's right. one of Jupiter's moons, I yeah. believe. Yeah. It's like maybe even the biggest moon mm -hmm. in our solar system. After doing some thinking about it, Woodrow thought that perhaps... He had been told it was Ganymede in order for Indrid to protect His themselves. Yeah, yeah, protect their planet. Which makes sense. Yeah, you know? by lying about where they're from. I wouldn't tell anyone here from where I was from. And that's why he thought, okay, he said Ganymede because that doesn't make sense. We know it's a moon, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, here's the other thing you could be thinking, or I, I was thinking. What if Indrid Cold is not an extraterrestrial? Okay. What if Indrid Cold, because they look like humans... Yeah. Right? Yeah. They speak similarly as yeah. humans. Yeah. And they seem to have some knowledge of our customs anyway. And judging by his conversations with Woodrow, their customs are similar. Similar and technologies wasn't... You know, wasn't that far off not, from our own. Wasn't that far from, from ours, yeah. Mm -hmm. What if Indrid Cold is not an extraterrestrial, but perhaps an individual from a parallel universe? Oh, that's very possible, man. Where all of the same things exist, just differently. Yeah. Because Indrid Cold told Woodrow that their lifespan is about 125 to 175 years of age. Right. And their planet has very similar flora and fauna to our own, with a few exceptions. Yeah. In order to have that much similarity, there's a couple of things that have to happen. Either Woodrow is making it completely up and using only what he knows, his knowledge base for that story. Right. Or it's not made up, and the evolutionary path that their planet has taken is very similar to our own. A which different is, timeline, that's all. Which is unlikely. That's why I'm suggesting perhaps a different yeah. timeline or a parallel universe, a, a different dimension where the same thing is happening, yeah. something to that effect. Yeah. And not necessarily that he's an extraterrestrial. You know what? I'll, I'll tell you something. I agree with you. A hundred percent in a way, because I've said this before. I think that we are on the wrong timeline. I said it changed somewhere around the 50s. Mm -hmm. And we should be in a totally different place than where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the other timeline. I don't know. Maybe. But our evolution has been stunted. Yeah. I mean, yeah, technologically, I guess we're moving forward. But nah, even in that. any other way, socially... Yeah, they give us trinkets. <laughs> yeah, to you know, keep you busy. Little iPhone. Oh wow! Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. That, that keeps you distracted. Yeah. Some beads. <laughs> some, some beads and guns and you mm -hmm. know, steal everything else. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I wonder if, not necessarily like I said, an extraterrestrial, but perhaps, a interparallel universal traveler. I don't know what you would call it, but yeah. you know, multi-dimensional. Yeah. Traveler you know I mean? of some form. Yeah. I, I, you know what? It's very, very probable. Well, there's a part in his story in the book that he talks about their history on Lanolos. And they talk about how the people inhabited the planet because there was a ship that crash landed there. Yeah, I, I missed Earth. this part. You told me about it. Yeah. 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 So they're saying a ship crash landed there from Earth. And they tried to fix the ship, yeah. and they were having trouble fixing the ship. And then they lo they basically became disenchanted with each other, and they started going off on the planet and making their own way, yeah. making their own living on the planet. And then nobody was fixing the ship, and they had all separated. And this is how they came to learn how to do thought transference, yeah. because they were all separated in different parts of the planet or different areas, making a living of their own. And they started to remember that they missed each other, and that... They, want, they miss their friends. Friends, yeah. yeah. And they started to realize that the deeper their thoughts were, one guy realized that his thoughts were so deep that he was actually hearing the other person that he missed talking to him. Talking to him, yeah. And that's what brought them closer together. And that's when they realized that mentally they were connected. 
And that's how they learned their, or they started evolving their yeah. telepathic abilities. Just kind of an awesome story. You know, it it would make total sense, man. It really, well, it really does. Because there's aspects of the book, which this, like as soon as I start reading this stuff, it starts to irk me. Because yeah. he starts talking about how they give credit for all this to God, mm-hmm. right? The only civilization, really, that has that kind of thinking is mm-hmm. our own. Is our own, yeah. And the only way that that would be taken to another planet is if people with that idea or that concept or yeah. belief system took it with Brought them to that there. planet. Yeah. No other planet is going to come up with the concept of God on yeah. their own, like actually use the word God. Yeah. They might have versions of, and it'd be called different things, but to actually use the word God, yeah. I think it has to come <clears throat> from a place where that belief system had already yeah, been in place. that way. So that would explain that belief if it was a ship that crash landed on the planet yeah. from Earth. Next question would be, what Earth? Because it wasn't our Earth. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have any history of exactly of that. What if, um, like his reference to Ganymede, that's Greek mythology. Mm-hmm. So they have access to knowledge. Yeah, for sure. Whether they, they got the knowledge from Earth, visiting Earth and talking to people like Woodrow for who knows how long, mm-hmm. right? Or whether their Earth evolved in the same way as our Earth and then, like you said, somewhere along the line split ways. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think so. And I bet you that the telepathic abilities grew they didn't realize that they were energetically tied to each other through like quantum entanglement right no matter how far apart you are you're still tied to that energy because that energy is intermingled yeah absolutely yeah if that's true if their history is a ship crash landed there yeah then that would explain why Woodrow believed that they had this, re- not religious, I guess, well, it is religious, belief system that... Or like we were saying before, you were saying, we were both saying that they used that because it was something he could understand. Well, he could he could associate with. Yeah. Because I think, he was, I think he was religious. I don't know how religious. Yeah. But I think he might have been Christian or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Or they never said those words to him at all. And that's how he understood it. Yeah. So that's how he explained exactly. it. Exactly. This is this is a thing. Yeah. They could have been using different words for that. I guess we'll not know. I would like I would like to think that that's not what happened because he seemed to be very honest in explaining details about what had happened previously. Oh yeah. So I find it hard to believe that he would mince words. Basically, you know what I mean? Yeah. He would he would get them he would get them wrong. Yeah. So there's there's a couple of possibilities there. Yeah. It could outright be a lie. But it could also be that if it's true, it happened in a universe that is running, you know, alongside ours. Yeah. I, I Because evolutionarily, right, the things that have to happen on a planet in order to get similar flora and fauna, fauna that we and have. Creatures and yeah, yeah. Is a certain amount of time and yeah. a certain amount of elements and, and chemicals and things have to come together in a certain Carbon. way under certain conditions <laughs> in order to have that effect water exactly all those things and what are the chances that the same type of thing in the same kind of way is going to happen someplace else yeah i think they're kind of slim yeah unless i mean slim outside of our own understanding our own universe but in a parallel universe it's very probable Uh, yeah absolutely maybe they had an earth maybe it's slightly different than this earth well dolores cannon talks about a second earth yeah yeah well, maybe then. You know, in uh, in the one book. Mm-hmm. I think it's called The Second Earth. I'm not sure, but uh, mm. anyway, she talks well, about it. Woodrow had also been investigated a few times on this too, right? Lots of people were investigating this guy, trying to prove whether his story was true or not true. Mm. And at one point, they actually did an e, uh, what do you call it, EEG? EEG, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> they did an, e, an EEG on him. And he was communicating with uh, Indrid Cold at the time. Right. And they were noticing that there was no difference in his brain waves, Like no. no difference in what was happening other than there showed a slight uptick in concentration while he's communicating. Other than that, they found everything was normal. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Where do you go from there? No, you don't. Yeah. Then eventually Woodrow has his first opportunity to be on the ship. Yeah. So... 
he was invited, injured cold, and his second in command, who we find out later, his name was Carl Ardo. Yeah. Um, so that would have been the second guy who was helping him into the ship. Yeah. And uh, he stopped him on stopped the road. the first time. So Carl Ardo and Indrid invited him on, on board and he was able to look around and check things out. And then uh, they said, we could take you for a ride. Yeah. At first he, he didn't want to. He was scared. Scared. Like he touched a panel, I think, that had like a blue light on it or something. And the door closed. That's when he realized he got the door thing wrong. Yeah. And then he thought, oh shit, I'm stuck in here. <laughs> and they're going to take me whether I want to go or not. And then he forgot that they were able to read his thoughts or hear his thoughts. Yeah. So they started laughing at him, actually. And they're like, we're not going to take you anywhere. <laughs> take you anywhere you don't want to go. go. Yeah. yeah. They asked him, didn't they? Where do you want to go? Yeah. He said he wanted to go to the Amazon. The Amazon. Yeah. So they took him to the Amazon. Yeah. And they flew over the Amazon jungle. And he wasn't quite sure why he said the Amazon, but I guess maybe he thought it's far enough away. We'll see what they can do. Yeah. So Indrid and Carl took him to the Amazon. They flew low over it and let him see it and all that stuff. And then after that, they took him out of the atmosphere. Yeah. Which, you know what, if you think about it, mm-hmm. common sense, where do you where do you want to go yeah. that you know yeah. so that you get used to f- this flight? You know, like, okay, yeah. well, we'll go there and, yeah. he, and it's safe. Yeah, and he said that um, while they were flying over, uh, when he did, he didn't see windows on the ship when it was on the side of the road. Yeah. But when they were flying, he said there was like covers that come over them, and it, the the covers come up, and that's when you have like almost like portholes where you can see out. Yeah. And you can see what's going on below you and stuff. Yeah. So at the time that he saw it on the road, all the windows were closed over. Mm-hmm. But they did have windows; they were just protected when it was landed yeah. by his truck. Yeah. After the Amazon, they took him to the moon. Yeah. They didn't land on the moon or anything. They did kind of like a flyby. Flying by, yeah. And they pointed out some interesting things on the moon to him, including this big cavern that they told him that's where some ships were parked in there. Yeah. On the moon. Then they docked with what Woodrow understood to be like a their, mothership. Their mothership. Yeah. yeah. And he said he described it as, as as big as a football field and about nine stories tall. That's huge. It's massive. Yeah. So they docked, and he was allowed to leave the ship, the the little ship that Indrid and Carl were flying, right. and board the mothership. And he was taken on a tour around the mothership. Yeah. And he was taken to like various places. He was even taken to the dining room where he had some food. Yeah. He said it was similar to like um, potatoes and green beans and some meat. He called it kautuma. Kautuma. Yeah, which he described as being like, um, similar to wild deer. Yeah, venison. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They did some other stuff. They did some other flybys and that, but uh, they didn't go to Lanolos. No. And it was explained to him that he couldn't go to Lanolos, like land on Lanolos, mm-hmm. because he needed to be inoculated. Inoculated. So that he didn't bring any diseases. Which makes absolute sense. Like, yeah. it just makes total fucking sense. I mean, you, you mm-hmm. do that here. Mm-hmm. So they, they did they did a flyby with him once. So he they went there and he was able to see it. They flew by low. He was able to see people. He was able to see the streams, the farms, the yeah. cities, the fields, Ground. yeah, all that kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, that was the first time that he was there. They did the flyby, but he, like I said, he was told that uh, they couldn't land or take him to the surface because he had to be inoculated, inoculated. Yeah. so that he didn't bring anything back to Earth with him, yeah. and that he didn't bring any Earth thing. Uh, with him Within there. to Lanolos. Yeah, makes absolute sense, man. Mm-hmm. So it was May 11th, 1967, mm-hmm. that Woodrow had a sales thing he was going to do in Pomeroy, Ohio. And it was about 35 miles, I guess, from where he is. And before he reached the city, he received a message from Indrid to meet him. Drives over there, meets him, and they tell him, we can take you to Lanolos. <laughs> so... He gets on the ship. He meets Indrid's wife, Kimmy. Kimmy, yeah. Carl's there. There's two other men that he said their names were Tony and Daryl. Daryl, yeah. He said the trip to Lanolos took about 30 minutes half Earth hour. time. Yeah, it felt yeah. Like it was a half hour, yeah. Before they got in there, the Daryl guy, he said, would be not quite a doctor, but like a medic from like the yeah. Air Force. Field medic. Yeah, he gave him a shot and a decontamination shower. Yeah. They landed on Lanolos, and Indrid took him... To his house. Yeah. And introduced him, him to his kids. Yeah. Yeah. Showed him around, took a tour of the city. Yeah. The gathering. The gathering. Actually, his city is called Gathering Number 27. 27, yeah. So they did a tour around Gathering Number 27. 
and then they uh, eventually went and did a tour of gathering number 28. Yeah. Before they did that, though, <laughs> he noticed that nobody wears clothes. Yeah, good nudists. Yeah, Lanolosians, I guess. Is yeah. that how you say it? Or they, nudists? Well, they don't wear them during their... They, there's only three oh, yeah. seasons. Oh, yeah, planting, harvesting, and cold. And cold. And they only wear clothes in cold. In cold. And yeah. when they're... I think there's some other times that they do, but anyway. Yeah. So Indrid and Carl ha- had asked him to disrobe. Yeah. It would make things a little bit easier. A little easier for him. And he was a little bit uncomfortable with it because he didn't see any like overweight peeps there and he didn't see any underweight peeps there. And yeah. he was a little bit overweight, so he's a little bit self-conscious and stuff. But uh, he did it and then he realized nobody gave a shit. No one even cared. Yeah, nobody cared. I don't care. Yeah. So <laughs> he talked to people. They were excited to meet an earth man. Yeah. Some had questions. Some wanted to know like why they fight all the time. Yeah, the war. That, that just blew me away. They yeah. just couldn't understand. You know, yeah. Well, why do you do that? Yeah. And he tried He tried his best to explain those things to them and how yeah. they how Earth people live to them, but he realized that it does sound kind of ridiculous and stupid. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Even, you know, I think about gathering 27, 28. Mm-hmm. It's, what's the... It's just a number, which is not like we have. China, mm-hmm. Russia, mm-hmm. United States, Canada... Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it doesn't different have different cities in those countries are different. Everything's different. It's the same. Yeah, just a number. Yeah, well, that's the thing because Woodrow was uh, asking number about of a region. Yeah, he noticed that they didn't have money. They used a system called credits. Credits. Yeah. And the idea was that each person got credits in lieu of pay, I guess, like currency pay. Right. Each everybody pers- worked. Too. Yeah, everybody worked, but how much you were paid was based on, I guess, the size of your family. Your family. Or your need. Your needs. Yeah. yeah. So that all your needs are met. And yeah, you can have whatever you want. Just So Woodrow had asked them if this was actually like a communism kind of way of living. And they said no. 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 It's not like that at all. Yeah. It's just it just makes sure that nobody ever wants for anything. Yeah. You just put the, it's just, the credits are just to keep inventory. Yeah, basically. If you need this, you get it. Mm-hmm. He said that they had uh, they had like cars, but not quite cars. They had vehicles. They were vehicles. They hovered. Of they had different no wheels sizes. or anything like that. Yeah, because they used one of those types of vehicles to travel from gathering number twenty-seven to gathering number twenty-eight. Twenty-eight. Yeah. And he said to him, I think he said at one point, I read somewhere that their technologies could be easily adaptable yes. to Earth right now yes. and easily understandable. Yes. And that was right now in 1966. Yeah. He said it wasn't, wasn't a big deal. It wouldn't be a big change. Mm-hmm. So he had, he had quite, a bu- quite, a bu- quite a few visits with Indrid and Carl, mm-hmm. and he met lots of other people. He yeah. met some people from different planets. He said that they have an intergalactic council, I guess, mm-hmm. that oversees what goes on in their... I guess group of planets. There's no elites. There's no elites. Yeah, the no, the no. highest person of the the council is the same as like a ditch digger. Yeah, basically, ditch digger could be on that council just as much as somebody yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. There was there was none of that. Yeah, a pretty utopic kind of. You know what? Makes life again sense. They uh, also sorry. No, they uh, also offered him the opportunity to live there. To live there, yeah. If he wanted to live there, they said, "We'll bring you and your family here, and you can live here. You you'll be given a, a job, and you'll yeah. you know, yeah, yeah." You can live the rest of your days here, or if you want to go back, we'll bring you back. Bring you back. Didn't he meet some people there? Uh, yeah, he met um, two they people. took him to people? Uh, the Petersons or something? Petersons, yeah. Who came from like Acapulco from, or something? Somewhere, yeah. So they, he said they looked about 50. They were actually like 90-something. Yeah. And they had been there for a long, long time. time. Raised they raised their children there. They were living the good life. Yeah. He said when he saw them the first time, they were playing some sort of a game that was similar to tennis. To tennis, yeah. Mm-hmm. Going back to the other one, I was going to say about, you know, this council. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be a ditch digger, could be this. I've talked to a few ditch diggers. Yeah, they're pretty they, smart. They should be on a council. They should be on a council. <laughs> you know, more so than some of these these wing nuts that are out there now. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So. He had he had quite a few experiences. They went on for a long time. Eventually, yeah. Woodrow passed away in 1990. 90, yeah. But I think people have been. He was kind broken of, too. I think he was. He broken. stopped talking about it yeah. because he had moved a lot and tried to avoid it, and it would keep coming up. And obviously, it had an effect on his ability to make a living. Look at the way people are, man. Oh yeah, the, know, the way this thing is gone, you know. And it kind of makes me laugh because you see this experience, you read this book. It's a beautiful book, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it's very, very possible. I mean, it's very, very. It's not probable, man. It's, mm-hmm. And then you see the way things go now. 
these hideous and crazy stories. Like, I don't even know what the truth is. This one is to me. Really, the only thing you can clue, if, if his experience is legitimate, the absolute truth is probably what he talked about on November 3rd, the very next day, yeah. doing a live interview, telling them this is what happened. Yeah. The very next day. This isn't somebody who's saying they had an experience 10 years ago. No. This isn't someone saying I had an experience a while ago and I wasn't comfortable talking about it. This guy had an experience, freaked out. Yeah. Family calls the, the police. The authorities. Yeah. They they mm-hmm. talk to Excuse him. Me. And then he says, sure, I'll tell you about I'll it on the news. It. Yeah. And he does a freaking news interview. Yeah. And you hear him speaking. He's just a He sounds like a really soft spoken, kinda like easy really guy. Nice. I'd like to know this guy, well, right? Then like, the thing just, is too, some people will be like, Well, he's a salesman. Yeah. So, so he's selling you. So? Selling you what? Selling you what? Sewing machines? Yeah. No, he's Obviously, selling he's selling he you extraterrestrials yeah. and friggin' everything else. The fucking sewing machines thing went bad for him. <laughs> Very bad. Because he doesn't make any money. Yeah, exactly. And he talks about that. Yeah. Yeah, I I just don't see why this guy would make this up. No, no, he didn't make it up. There's this really very, happened to him. There's very real potential that as his story continued, it got elaborated. Anything's possible, yeah. right? I, I, the core is, though, Yeah. a ship landed on a fucking highway, and a dude came out and talked to him mentally yeah. and asked him, hey, what's going on? Who are you? What's your name? Yeah. And we'll talk. We'll chat with you later. Again, they're very similar types of beings that uh, Adamski talks about mm-hmm. and Van Tassel, same, mm-hmm. and a few others. Yeah, Van Tassel was given the <clears throat> prince to build the Integratron. Yeah. Which, Again, he, which the government shut him down. Shut him down, yeah. Yeah, so... You know, and the thing that I... Uh, we'll talk... We'll probably have shows about these other guys anyway, but mm-hmm. I noticed that, that that timeline, something happened. These beings were coming around. They were just normal, nice... Mm-hmm. Wanting to help, mm-hmm. and uh, you you go back to William Cooper's book, who says that they tried to converse with uh, the government, mm-hmm. and they turned them down because they weren't willing to give them secrets about killing. Okay, hold on, no, you know? hold on. Uh, oh, the the violence, the extraterrestrials weren't willing to give exactly. up secrets on give how to secrets. kill people, and and they were telling them to stop the nuclear bombs. And we'll help you do other things. You know, yeah. we'll help you do all kinds of things. They get turned down. Well, I, I, and that's where I think the timeline, boom, just went sideways. But anyway. Well, the thing is, Woodrow has so said, Cooper. yeah, Woodrow has said that really what they wanted from him was to be a sort of ambassador or sort of diplomat, liaison of some form, yeah, liaison yeah. to try and bring awareness yeah. of their existence to Earth people, yeah, so that. We could share ideas and Not concepts. Be afraid. And yeah, yeah, it's networking. Yeah, it's absolutely. friggin' networking, yeah. interplanetary network, or maybe interdimensionally networking. Yeah, yeah. Didn't he say that they tried to go and talk to their officials? officials. Yeah, but they don't. They don't. But have... they told them, "Forget it. Get out of here. You're not going to give us something that we can kill people with and control them with." Well, you know what? We don't yeah. want you. Yeah. Go away. I don't know. What a sad. It's sad. Man. It's sad, but you know what? Let's let's be realistic, right? We all know that it happens. We all know that oh, yeah. there's the potential for other uh, other beings and so on and so forth out there. And, you know, maybe some of us or most of us hope that we're in a situation where we're as lucky as Woodrow where someone decides to talk to us on the side of the highway. And if that's the case, maybe we can get some information that we can share with people who will bring some some knowledge. I'd love to meet an injured cold, man. Oh, yeah. And you know what? Yeah. I'd go there. I would. I would go there. Yeah, man. Me too. I, I'd, I'd absolutely go there. Yep. Like to live? To live, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm down with that. Right. I, I, and I mean it. I, I, yeah, so do I. I'm I, tired of here. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's not even that. It's just like, you know what? I've had enough of dogma and everything that's around it. I agree. I agree with you. I think what's kind of sad about this is that this guy had a really awesome experience. And over time, we've seen the de-evolution of this whole experience yeah. into some creepy memes Terrifying encounters. Yeah, pictures of injured cold. Like yeah, a, that are like just... these are creeping, psychotic Yeah, so murderer. what is the point of that? Is the point of that to dissuade you from ever wanting to have an experience like that? I think it's to keep you scared. Yeah, because if you're living in fear, then you can be more easily controlled. Controlled, absolutely. There we go. Always, like I said, uh, you know, how things changed. 
Yeah, I agree. You had these people back in the 50s not that had experiences that were beautiful. And then... There was another guy, actually, who cooperated his story called... Uh, I think his name was Ed Bailey. Yeah. He was a young college kid. Yeah. He met Indrid. Yeah. And he was able to confirm... He went to Lanolos, too. Yeah. And he was able to confirm the story. They actually went to talk to him, and they brought Woodrow. And Woodrow said, if he talks about this particular item, which was like a, a sled or a, something that flies, like a personal pleasure craft of some sort. Right. If Ed Bailey talks about that thing, then I know he's and been there. describes it. Yeah, yeah, I know he's been there. I know, and he and did. And he did. He did, and he did. So what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. And then, yeah, like I'm looking on the internet for a picture of injured Cole, and it's all just... People with joking face, like Joker faces. Well, even people that make their, they try to do something, wrong, but the voices. And on September sixteenth, there was a man, and he was in the dark in the rain, and he smiled. <laughs> like he kind couldn't. of fucking bullshit is this? <laughs> Listen to the guy's interview, the actual guy who was there. <laughs> oh yeah, he was a very nice man, and yeah, he's like nothing to fucking do with it. <laughs> It's just so annoying. I hate man. that. I hate that so much. There's a man. <laughs> he was smiling at him. <laughs> you know, like he's a fucking devil. It's just so sad, man. I know. There's fucking I know. idiots on there. Oh, I fucking hate that one. So when... annoying. You're trying to. I hate it. Like, just don't. Yeah. Just don't. <laughs> you know? Fuck. You're going to spook it up. Yeah. Like, yeah. Then they call him the grinning man. The grinning they man. They call him the smiling man. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly believe that's where the Slender Man came from. Maybe. Because it looks the same. Yeah, some of those pictures are kind of... The, no, the Slender Man doesn't have a face. Oh, he doesn't? Oh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> the Slender Man. Yeah. He well, doesn't have if you a read, face. Okay, stop now. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> You're going to get hired for narrating spooky shows. <laughs> The thing is, is that sometimes you see descriptions. This is not how Woodrow described him. No. They'd be like, he had beady eyes and he was bald. None of those things. Even a are tie. What, he didn't have a tie. Woodrow didn't say any of those no. things. So. Where this comes, how it evolved into this, people keep adding their own shit to it. Their own spin, because yeah. I guess they're trying to sell it. So you got to exactly. add a little, you got to add a little razzmatazz there to get people Jesus. in on it. Jesus. Because the story itself is just not enough, right? No, no. That's not... Just that something came from somewhere else in a different ship, that's not enough. Well, here's the other thing, too, that kind of... I, I remember reading this. The guy who investigated the Mothman sightings, right? Yeah. That were taking place in West Virginia. John Keel? Yeah, around yeah. the same time. He said that he received a call from Indra Cold. Yeah. Really? A call. Yeah. A phone call? Guy talks with his head. Yeah. He talks, he talks through telepathy. Yeah, he talks telepathically. <laughs> Why the fuck would he pick up a phone to call you? <clears throat> to give you a call. Come on, man. Yeah. For real. It seems and like... And I think that that thing right there, that one little thing right there, is when people are like, oh, they're they're connected. No. It could have been anybody fucking calling up and being like... I'm injured cold. Yeah, fuck. Woodrow was on the news talking about this stuff. Yeah. People were coming to his house to wait and see freaking spaceships. Yeah. So it's not like Indrid Cold was never heard of before. Yeah. So you can't unequivocally say somebody didn't ring you up and lie to you. Yeah. yeah. I would be more believing if you said, oh, I got some messages in my head. I got the tingling forehead and yeah. then this guy named Indrid Cold Someone told me to go to, me. to this parking lot and all of a sudden I met somebody there. Exactly. So that's the story anyway. I don't know what else to tell you about it other than Lanolos is maybe a real place, could be a real place. If it's a real place, I think it's a, a parallel place. I, I absolutely. I think it's a. Real, I think this story is real. I, I really think his do. story is real too. I, he doesn't have any reason to lie. Yeah, I felt. I've, he didn't gain anything from it. No. Like I said, he he wrote a hundred and nine page book about his experience in nineteen seventy one. Yeah, that's why I didn't buy the other ones. I just got this one. This is the original. Well, his daughter has written a book or something like that, but I don't know. Are you just piggybacking off of it? Exactly. Were you there? No. no. Well, she was young at the time. I think four or something. But even so, like, I just don't... Yeah, no. I'm not going to go for it. No. It's not your story. Yeah, it's his. When I start reading things where people are talking about... Here's one. This is one that... This pissed me off, too. Indrid Cool's favorite songs? Oh, yeah. This is great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Major Tom? Yeah. And Rocket Man? 
Yeah, that's Are you beautiful. fucking kidding me? Yeah, that's just love. Of all of the music on this planet that he could have liked, <laughs> he's gonna go he to picks those the space too. oriented music. He's not music. gonna talk about Mozart or any nah, of these other. No, <laughs> no, no Tchaikovsky, you know. Or even the Beatles, for Christ's sake, Zagorski. or whatever. Those yeah. are great songs. Yeah. I don't say, but no Rimsky. Really, those no, are the two. Yeah, the two space oriented rock space songs. Space Give me songs. a fucking break. Oh man! See, yeah. that's when it, that's when that's, it loses its credibility exactly. because people are like, "Oh, you know what song the spaceman like the space songs?" Yeah, come on, yeah, come on, guys! It's just nonsense. You got to get better, you know. It's fucking nonsense. So, if you're interested in actual information about Indrid Cold and Woodrow Derenberger's experience, experience, yeah, the one, book. then his book. That he had somebody help him write, actually. I guess he just kind of dictated and that yeah. person wrote it's not it very for him. a long book either. No, like it's I said, it's 109 pages. Pages, yeah. It's called Visitors from Lanelos. Yeah. It's the only one he wrote, and it's by Woodrow Derenberger. So D E R E N B E R G E R. Yeah. Great book. It's very, if you want to know about his experience, check it out there. Yeah. You can also look up his interview online. It's on YouTube. Yeah. If you type in, I think if you type in his name, it'll come up. Yeah. Now there's a bunch of other. F- Fucking garbage. Just don't go to the junk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually, see. actually, go go to that interview first, and then see how stupid the junk is. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull up the actual address for that one that we watched because I thought it was pretty good. And there was another one too where they had pit a picture. There was another person who uploaded the interview and had a picture of Derenberger and Mains because Mains was holding the microphone. It wasn't live video, but you could see uh, Mains holding the microphone as Derenberger spoke. And the spoke. interview's going. Yeah. 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 So let me just punch this in. So there's two. If you type in Woodrow Derenberger in YouTube, you get one that's called The Man Called Cold. And then you get another one called Indrid Cold, The Woodrow Derenberger Interview with captions, yeah. which might be a little bit better. Yeah. I don't know. Oddly enough, posted by someone called The Mothman Historian. So who knows? But he oh, also whatever. says The Mothman Historian in comments says that the two things are not connected. Yeah. It's a 30 minute interview. So yeah, if you're interested in hearing this it's guy's really good. voice, it's it's really really good. And you a decide for interview. yourself whether you think he sounds like a liar or not, because yeah. he didn't to me. Not to me either. Yeah, I, I highly highly doubt it. Check it out for yourself. Yeah. After that, everything else sounds like malarkey. Watch us. <laughs> right. Ridiculous. All right. All right. Well, that's it. Hopefully. We can get an injury cold one time yeah. to visit us. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Come on the show. Yeah. Well, we'll do other other uh, people that have had similar experiences like Adamski and... And Van Tassel, Van yeah. Tassel and others mm-hmm. that I, you know, I love those ones. Mm-hmm. They're so real, man. They're great stories. That's that. That is that. That is your introduction to the real story of Ingrid Cold, Ingrid Cold as yeah. told by Woodrow Derenberger. It's a beautiful story. From November 1966. Yeah. Yeah. No joker face grinning man. No. No creepy no bastard stopping you on the highway and freaking you the fuck out. Yeah. Just a dude from another planet who had some questions. Like he, a tourist, really. Yeah, and even like I said, well, he went to the wind. How come he went to the other side of the window? Because, because the cars are on going the on, the, road. on the road. Yeah, that yeah. was another one. Yeah, like, people are, <laughs> people are fuck like, why think? did he go to the passenger it's not side? stupid. Because he's not going to stand in the road. Yeah. How many videos have we Get seen of out. cops and people getting <laughs> picked off on exactly. the highway? Might have been 1966 and he might be from someplace else, but he's this not stupid. Not stupid, yeah. Jesus. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we're ranting here. You're ranting. Uh, yeah. I joined in. Yeah. yeah. It pisses me off. Yeah, it pisses a lot of people off. No. Anyway, are yeah. you done ranting or are you going to drop another bomb? I'm done. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So that's that. That's Injured Cold. Yes. Yep. And uh, Woodrow Derenberger. Yeah, awesome. May he rest in peace. God love him, man. He's just just a nice guy. Yeah, seems so. Seems so. All right, everyone. Have yourself a great evening. Yes. Look forward to seeing you on the next one. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Hopefully you all have your own injured court visitations yeah. one time. If you're into it, of course. And if you do, call us. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about it. Yeah. We want to know about it. Yeah. All right. Take Talk care, soon. everyone. Yeah. Bye. Visit us at our website at thetrianguliumpodcast.com or email us at thetrianguliumpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook. Your support, as always, is appreciated.